Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm very happy that we, uh, I think, got some of the technicalities in, uh, in place. It's a real pleasure to see, and this is where we stand. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to see uh, friends, colleagues, and people interested in the topic uh, here today. Uh, my name is Cindy Horst. I work at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, where I'm a research professor. And I've also led the TRANSFORM project that you'll hear more about today. Um, we thought that before delving into questions on social justice and sharing the stories of the remarkable individuals we met over the last four years in Myanmar, in Syria, and in Somaliland, we should actually first experience music. To land in this place and this space where we've all come together today, uh, both to be grounded, but also maybe to be lifted. And uh, we've been extremely fortunate that uh, Shibil Salem accepted our request to play for us today. Shibil is currently studying music at Hoyskule in London. He's an oud player who performs regularly across Norway. And uh, he, uh, he also just uh, told me over, uh, over lunch that he... Uh, He's working together also with an oud maker in Amsterdam, so he's not just interested in creating the music, but also the instrument and, and what it does and how, uh, how it all comes into being. So I would like to uh, give the floor to Shibil before we uh, discuss the, uh, the project. Welcome.
It was uh, very emotional to play for uh, some like people after the pandemic. <laughs> so uh, it was the first concert after ba after the pandemic, like without any uh, distance, without any one meter of stand. So and it's somehow uh, funny, but very great. My name is Shibli. Thanks for uh, for you for uh, for their invitation, and thanks for Cindy. I'm very glad to uh, present uh, one part, like one part of many other part of the Arabic folk music. This part was um, called Taktuqa, composed by Sayyid Darwish. Maybe many of you know, um, are known with the, with the name, Sayyid Darwish. Anyone here about the name? Yeah, hi, by the way. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the great thing about Sayyid Darwish is that he's not only composed and, and uh, wrote uh, folk music. He, he, he wrote somehow a, a classical Arabic music, which has became an, uh, a folk music, which is, I found it very interesting uh, because it, was not, it wasn't common by that time to write and compose this style of music and to contain a, a, a hardcore Arabic uh, notes without any borrowing from the classical music or the Ottomani music and Turkish music. And I think that the secret of it was that it was very near of people. So, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe this, is, this is all, all about folk music, that it's really made for folk. And it's, it could be lived for hundred, hundred of years just because it's made for people, it's made for general, it's made without any complications, without any... Uh, hidden uh, stuff that musicians are really fascinated about it those days. So, uh, yeah, that was the first part. I'm gonna represent another uh, form of the oriental music, Arabic music in parent is called taqasim, which is mainly an improvisation, but it has its own form. Um, it, it's gonna take care about uh, the maqam and uh, the duration inside the, the notes and the melodic uh, part. So I hope you, um, you hope you enjoy with me because I'm really enjoying this actually, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it was very enjoyable thing to play for people after the pandemic without any of this kind of Corona rules. Thank you, uh, and again, I hope that you guys gonna enjoy with me, hopefully. So right now, at the moment, I'm going to. Uh, play another um, systematical uh, melodic form in oriental music called maqam, which is, uh, um, it can be representing uh, um, the major scale of the oriental music called rast. So if we are going to look uh, deep to uh, the western music and its major scale, we should hear this one. But in Oriental music, it's totally different because we have something called the quarter tone and coma system. By this system, we are dividing the note to <laughs> nine sections and not eight sections, which is we always have. Like if you guys can imagine with me that we have a piano and it has its own white keys and black keys. 
So it's only one one interval and a half interval, but in Oriental music, Arabic music, so there is so many notes between the black and the white one. And that's why you're going to hear this sound, so. So this is not a very usual sound. But in its own context, so it has its own name, and we are really composing a whole melody, a whole form, based on these two notes called sika, which is what's representing the oriental music. Yeah, that was the theoretical part. Maybe you guys don't need to hear this. <laughs> but uh, I thought it could be nice to just like uh, introduce uh, some of the Arabic um, scales. Thanks uh, for listening to me, and I hope you guys again gonna enjoy this. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Um, I really thought also the uh, uh, explanation of the, the musical technical part was actually quite relevant because there is a resistance also in the yeah the folk m music and what it goes back to and uh, and what it uh, uh, resists in a way. So uh, thanks very much also for getting us grounded here today. Uh, we are I think we are all here now and welcome to those who. Uh, who recently arrived. Um, we've invited you here today to show some of the gl some glimpses of our learning over the last four years for a project that's called Transform that was funded by the Research Council of Norway. To me, Transform has been really special, not just for the great people that uh, were part of it, uh, but also because of two other aspects, uh, the content and the approach. Uh, the question that we've posed is, in societies at war or facing severe repression, what motivates individuals to take actions for social justice when doing so can actually entail great risk and uncertainty? Um, and there we have explored these questions in three different contexts. Uh, historically, in Somaliland, focusing on a group of teachers and doctors who engaged in humanitarian work to support their community during dictatorship. Uh, the UFO group, and we'll learn more of the group today. And for some of you, if you haven't seen it, there is a, a comic book on the UFO that you uh, are welcome to take with you. Then in Myanmar, where we met land rights activists and educational activists, as well as students, to understand the different forms of public and more covert resistance, as well as in Syria, where we focus on educational activists. So the focus of our work has been deeply inspiring because it allowed us to meet remarkable people and uncover stories of everyday resistance in, against injustices in contexts where the common narratives we learn about focus on suffering or victimhood. Our approach has also made the uh, project special, I would say, because we mostly asked these remarkable people uh, to tell us the story of their lives. And then we worked with uh, local research assistants, storytellers, artists, to capture some of these stories audiovisually. Uh, and this has added a crucial element to our research, not just in terms of collectively developing knowledge with all these different people and different positioned people, but also because we move beyond the verbal. We move beyond uh, the, the words that are so common in social sciences and work with images and sounds in a more integrated way, uh, way. And especially if you work on uh, the human consequences of violent conflict, uh, I think words very often uh, are insufficient and a lot of our knowledge is deeply ingrained in, in other parts of our knowing. Today you'll hear from all the researchers in the project. Ben Dix from Positive Negatives unfortunately couldn't be here, uh, but we'll watch him soon present the work we've uh, done with the animations and the comics. And then Martin Nielsen and uh, Trude Stapnes, both colleagues at PRIO, uh, they will explore one of uh, our key findings, which relates to the sense of responsibility that those who've experienced violence, oppression, injustice often feel. And they are drawing on their work in, uh, in Myanmar. Um, then Shette Selvik at uh, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and Tama Gross, Universidad de Extremadura, sorry for mispronouncing that. Uh, they will provide an example of another key finding, and that is that resistance can take many forms in contexts where public protesting may be very dangerous and counterproductive. Uh, they will talk about educational initiatives in, uh, in Syria, but, uh, but art is another example of uh, the ways in which people can uh, resist in more, um, uh, I wouldn't say safe ways, but, uh, but at least less uh, risky ways at times. Then Eva Tellan, the uh, doctoral researcher on the, on the project, and she's also based at Priya, she will explore the remarkable story of the UFO group of professionals in Somaliland who paid a high price for their social activism during the dictatorship in the 1980s. And she will reflect on the transformative potential of storytelling. As some of you know, I normally organize ev events that are highly interactive with the audience, uh, but today we'll have lots of variation in how we present, uh, drawing on the virtual exhibition that I encourage you to, um, to look at afterwards. Um, but uh, so this time there won't really be time for interaction, but we are here at Kulturhuse, so 
hopefully some of you uh, might want to interact with us once the formal part is over. And what I'll try to do now is get you to listen to Ben. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very sorry I can't be there with you all today um, due to, to COVID and all these difficulties in traveling. I'm, I'm unable to come. But um, uh, what I wanted to present today was the uh, positive negatives um, contribution to the Transform project. Um, and I'm going to, I hope you can all see my screen. Um, so I'm going to present the way that we uh, produced, developed, researched the two animations and the comic um, on the three case studies that you're hearing about uh, this afternoon. So a quick bit of background. Uh, my name is Benjamin Dix. I'm the uh, director and founder of Positive Negatives, and we're based at SOAS, University of London. Um, we produce comics, animations of uh, mostly academic research, but also um, with NGOs. We've done work, uh, a lot of work with Creo in the past and with uh, Norwegian People's Aid on Syrian migration. Um, and it's been an absolute joy and a pleasure to work with this fantastic team that you have in front of you today. And uh, again, I'm very sad that I'm not, I'm not with everyone today. Um, but we've been working together for, I think, about the last three and a half, four years now on this project. And so I'm just going to run through some of the, the, um, the, the research, the development that went into producing these um, comics and animations. So I'll start with the Somaliland um, Ufu group, the, the case study there, where in 2018, in October, um, Cindy and Eba and myself and my colleague Poppy, uh, we traveled to Hargeisa, Somaliland, and we had a wonderful opportunity there to meet uh, some of the, many of the elders of the Ufu group. And you can see here that we, we spent many hours sitting under a tree outside the cultural center in Hargeisa and hearing the stories of, of their struggle um, of, of developing the, the Ufu and and the issues that they went through, what they were fighting for, and I'm sure Eva and Cindy will discuss that at length, so I won't get into the, the actual issues through these uh, case studies. But we spent a lot of time with them and really getting to know their stories and them as characters, because what's really important in our work of Positive Negatives is that we're developing these um, very personal stories, these human stories, to try and reach much wider audiences than the academic work um, and so it's really important to try and flesh out um, these human stories and the characters there and this really was a, a group of characters they were there were some really um, funny and and highly intelligent and um, just yeah really really great characters we enjoyed it a lot so we recorded their stories and then uh, it was our job to take those kind of testimonies, those life history testimonies, and uh, work with them to turn them into a script. And so with that adaptation of taking, you know, pages and pages of testimony and then turning that into a script, uh, and then also uh, translating that into Somali, so an English and Somali script. So that went through a kind of process in, up to February 2020. And through that time, we were constantly sending uh, the script and our ideas back to a few members of the UFU um, so that they got to approve it, uh, to comment on it, give us feedback and, and really shape it. So it was a very collaborative uh, process of, of, of developing the script, something that you know we were happy with as the creative team, Eber and Cindy were happy as the research team, and most importantly, the UFU were happy that this truly represented their experiences. Um, and then unfortunately we couldn't, we tried really hard to find a Somali artist and there's lots of uh, Somali illustrators and painters out there, but it's always been quite a struggle to find um, uh, within the Somali community, people who can draw sequential art. 
and tell stories through sequential art. So finally, we settled with Pat Massoni, who is a Congolese artist based in France. And he really jumped at the chance of working on this because he had, um, growing up in the Congo, he was very aware of uh, the, the Somali and the Somaliland struggles. Um, and, and, and he felt it a great honor to, to um, be drawing this story. So as with any project, we start with character development. And here you can see that he took a lot of our photographs and started to illustrate. Um, uh, you can see the, the elders down there in the bottom and then what they would have looked like uh, back in the, the 70s and 80s. Um, and then, and obviously at each stage throughout this whole presentation, at every stage we were sending these back to the members of the UFU to get their feedback. Um, and then that turns into a storyboard of sketches that you can see there on the left. Um, and as we lay out the, the storyboard, you start to get a, a sense of how this story is going to progress and how it will flow. That's sent back again for further feedback and comments of how places looked. And um, you can see there in the in the top left of the, the gentleman standing looking at the view and then here in the right, in the middle, in the ink, um, they wanted the roundabout you might be able to see there in the in the middle of the city. That was a, an important landmark that should be there from from the vantage point of that mountain. So details like that really started to come out into the artwork. Um, and then as the uh, art starts to progress, we then put the ink on the top. And I think Pat has done a, a really amazing job here with the um, with with his color palette of, of getting that that red, dusty, yellow colour um, that you find in Somaliland um, and, and across the Horn of Africa. Uh, and it's really kind of captured that, that sense. Uh, so that was done through March 2020. And we were about to, oh, and then we, we uh, made that into English and into Somali. So English there you can see on the left and Somali on the right. And we were about to start going into recording um, in... February, March 2020, uh, and then the coronavirus hit. And it was obviously very difficult with this project because there were about nine characters for this animation. And you can imagine at the beginning of COVID where everything was locked down, trying to find nine Somali voiceover artists who can all come together into a studio and record at the beginning of COVID or any time through 2020 was just an impossible task. So we rescoped it into producing a 15 page comic instead of an animation, which the other two case studies, uh, Syria and Myanmar are animations. Um, and uh, so that, that, that was a bit of a shame, but uh, we produced a really nice comic. And anyway, now uh, as from uh, this week, we're now have got the voiceover and we're producing it into um, a, a, a kind of simplified animation um, that hopefully will be launched by the end of October. So please look out for that. We'll be sending details when that comes out. Um, and so that was really the whole process of going through the Somaliland um, comic and process. And then we put that out into social media and to, you know, uh, we shared that a lot and, and it got a lot of great feedback from the Somali community. But I think we're really kind of excited as well to say, to push it out onto YouTube as a as an animation by the end of October. So we'll send links when that comes. And then for the Myanmar uh, project with uh, the protagonist Darbak Jar. So different to the Ufu project, which was a collective group of people that made up the Ufu group, the Myanmar project was a, a an individual. Um, and an individual who was um, able to show her identity through the project, um, which is different from the Syrian project. So this was our team in February 2018. Um, so you can really see the, the length of time that we've been working on this project. Um, so there we all are. Um, you can spot me, I'm a bit taller than most. Um, and uh, uh, that was us in Darbak Jar, who is second from the left there. Uh, in the in the uh, orange and the yellow uh, clothes, so um, we went. Um, Marte, who you can see there at the back, uh, her and I went there in um, uh, February, and we did the first interviews with Darbak Jar, and then from that interview, again, we started to develop that into a script, 
and the first round of script, we send that back to Darbak Jar at the end of November uh, 2018. And so she was able to read her story as a, as a script and give the feedback. And then in January 19, um, luckily I was there, I was in Myanmar on another project and Marta and I were able to travel back up there and sit down with her and really get the feedback and go through the script line by line, which was, which was great. We don't often have, you know, the ability, the time, the funding to be able to return. It just so happened that um, I was in the country and, and Marta was in the country at the same time. So we were able to do that and go back. And at that point we found uh, Ku Kool, who is there on the right, the young Burmese artist from Yangon. And so we were able to take her up to Mishina, uh, which is where Darbak Jar lives in the north, in the Kachin area of North Myanmar. And I'm sure Marte will talk about this at length of, of how, of, of, of the experience of that. It was, um, you know, Kukul is in her mid twenties and she's grown up as a urbanite in, in the capital Yangon and has kind of been fed, you know, government propaganda of, of of the demons of the north of the Kachin of, of who are fighting the, the 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 Burmese army and 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 to take Kukul up there to fly her up to Mishnah to a place that she would never have dreamed of visiting and to sit in front of Darbak Jar this elder land right land rights activist an incredibly powerful woman um, and to kind of witness Kukul's kind of, you know, uh, her entire life of being fed this propaganda of who these people are up in the north and then to suddenly to, to witness her kind of taking it all in and the hospitality and the food and the, the, the gentleness of Darbak Jar kind of telling her her story and going through this was, was a really wonderful experience. I think something that I'll certainly take away from this entire project was that, that experience of that trip um and so they got on really well which of which also helped the development of the artwork and the, the building the story um and we were able to visit um uh, uh Darbak Jar's parents so you can see there on the left mother and father and really again kind of develop the whole story of who she was and as a as a young person as a young girl kind of growing up and her character, her, her experiences that made her into this kind of fierce activist now in her, in her adult life. Um, and that was me with uh, Dalbak Jar's mother. I always like that picture because she, she said that uh, she'd never met a giant before. So uh, that, that was always a really nice takeaway from that project. And then Kukul started to develop, like with the Ufu project, um, the initial sketches, the character sketches of the project uh, of the story and you can see here the kind of sketches and again we could send that back to uh, Darbak Jar but at that point Kukul was in direct communications with Darbak Jar so that was really nice that we could almost be kind of hands off and just allow Kukul and Darbak Jar to develop that story um, and then again on another project trip two of my team of positive negatives were in Myanmar for another project and they were able, you can see there in the middle picture, um, my two colleagues on the left, uh, left and middle, were able to meet Kukul there on the right and give her an animation workshop. And that again was something really lovely from this project that Kukul had never done animation before. She, she was an illustrator and a comic book artist. And so um, uh, we were able to kind of you know, mentor her and, and, and kind of build her capacity um, to producing animations, which was again a lovely um, thing, a legacy to, to leave behind in this project. So we've now skilled up a, a, a young artist in Yangon, and Kukul now has actually become probably the most prominent um, activist uh, illustrator on social media through the coup um, earlier this year. She's doing amazing work um, and, and again, a great legacy of the Transform project, I think, of really rising her confidence um, and, and her ability to produce art. So we would get the storyboard, uh, the, the script, and turn that into a storyboard and, again, get further feedback uh, and going from scene to scene and then really starting to cut that uh, storyboard down into a script to do a voiceover. Um, for the 
um, for the animation. And like I said, unfortunately, we couldn't do that for the Ufu one in Somaliland because there were so many characters. Whereas for this one in uh, Myanmar, it was just Darbak Jar's uh, voice. So we only needed one person to record. Um, and then Kukul would start to develop the inks and the sketches would start to take on the, the deck uh, with the inks and the coloring coming in. And here you can see Kukul and Darbak Jar uh, recording the voiceover in Yangon. Uh, and unfortunately, we couldn't use that voiceover um, because you realize actually as lovely as that would have been for Darbak Jar to have done the voice for the animation, um, you realize that actually recording voiceover for an animation is an incredibly skilled job. Um, and and uh, it just didn't have the right kind of pace and, and intonations going through the voice and the length as well. It was, it was way too long. So um, we ended up commissioning a, uh, a, 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 a Kachin woman who lives in London, Atang, who's here on the right. And she uh, um, did the voiceover for us in London. And she knew Darbak Char as well from Mishina. So it still stayed within the same kind of family and had all the right feelings. But she could also record it in uh, Burmese, in Kachin, and in English. Um, and so we, we did voice recordings in, in London in November 2019, when studios were still open and we were able to do those kind of things. And then the last. Um, uh, case study is the Syria uh, case study on the teachers and this is the one where we uh, positive negatives weren't able to do um, uh, any um, first person field work um, so Shetil will um, describe uh, the way he went through the interview processes for these and what we received was working with Shetil very closely was his testimonies from the animations and so because of security concerns in Syria at the time and now, um, we decided um, the safest way was to amalgamate a few different stories so that we produced a kind of non-fiction fiction, if you like, that uh, everything that happens in the animation has happened and, and is based on testimonies and interviews. But due to security concerns, by amalgamating uh, two or three uh, different life histories and, and uh, people's experiences, we can kind of create these fictional characters that live out these non-fiction um, um, events through their life. And so we got the testimonies from Sheffield in January 2019, and then we started to adapt those testimonies and, like I said, amalgamate two or three testimonies into uh, the script um, and to tell the story. And then we uh, worked with this wonderful uh, Syrian artist, Diala Brisley, who um, uh, is from Syria herself, now living uh, in France. And so she was able to really, like uh, Kukul in Myanmar, was able to really bring her own understanding and kind of the details and nuance of, of the um, of, of, of Syria, of, of the dress, of the clothes, of the environment, of the architecture into the animation. And so she was doing these um, storyboards and then uh, uh, producing the animation through the, the time, um, time lapses going through there. Um, and then into the animatrix, which you should be able to see here, which is the kind of before the color really goes on. So it's the the very first bit of the animation that we, we see before the, all the, the faces, for example, here are put into the uh, drawings. Um, and, and then, oh yeah, that's him. Um, and so then the animation that you'll see, I think Shetel will, um, will play the actual animation um, after his talk on this, on this event today. So that's how we produced three, um, the two animations and the comic. Um, and I hope that was interesting for you all to, to have an understanding of all the work that goes on behind the scenes that creates a kind of four minute animation. There's a, a huge amount of work and, and feedback and rounds of comments and checking to, to really try and make a, a piece of, of visual research outputs. Um, 
And once again, I'm very sorry that I can't be there, but I hope you have a, a lovely afternoon and I will hand you back now to whoever's moderating, I assume Cindy. All right, take care, bye-bye. Thanks. Um, so that was quite a detailed um, explanation of some of the visual storytelling that we've uh, we've done. I'm sure you're also quite keen on maybe both um, seeing some of these animations that have been talked about and also hearing more about our findings and some of the stories that uh, Ben has started to. Uh, to talk about, so I think we'll start with an animation, and then Marta will uh, will explain also more about the project. I grew up in a small village in Kachinlan. My parents were teachers, and I was the eldest of seven siblings. On the 25th of April, 1976, the military came and our lives changed forever. We will never forget that day. We had to flee to our village and headed to the town of Mijina. We hid from the military for weeks. It was terrifying. When I was 12, the police seized rice bag from me, saying that we were not allowed to take it from one place to another as part of the full cut policy. I was so angry. I wasn't thinking clearly. I snatched the rice bag and ran away with my sisters following me. I realized I couldn't live with this injustice. My parents used to say, we have nothing else to give you but education. All of us graduated from university, which was very rare for the family then. When I study for my history degree, I also work in the municipal government to support my family. In 1988, there were uprisings in Yango. The violence was shocking. I tried to participate, but I had to support my family. When the students fled for the jungle, I gave them almost all the money I had. After graduating, I moved to the remote kitchen village and opened kindergarten. I wanted to focus my energy on my people. It felt good to follow in the footsteps of my parents. But then the military and large companies came to the village and began taking our land, clearing it for their own profit. They pushed people into landless poverty. I began to confront them. I knew my rights from the working at the municipal government in Yangon. I knew that they shouldn't do this. I quickly gained a reputation as a troublemaker. The police were always trying to catch me. I was lucky. I managed to escape them many times, but I had to move around carefully, often in disguise. It was scary, but also quite exciting. Finally, we managed to put one of the large companies on trial and they agreed to give some compensation for villagers who have been displaced. Winning that case gave me strength to go forward. The company agreed to build a school and hospital for the village as compensation for all the misery they had caused. They built the school, but the hospital has never been built. In 2010, I decided to run for the elections. I had loads of support among the rural communities. My opponent in the elections was a former military general. He was a very powerful man, and it was clear that his campaign was corrupt, so I filed a case against him for election fraud. That was an important but dangerous move. The general and the company wanted me arrested by any means, and they finally got their way. I had tried to help a sick man in the village. There were no doctors in the area, and my family had often helped the sick. <laughs> But the man sadly died. I was arrested for this old case and charged for administrating medicine without a license. I was in prison for six months and witnessed a lot of brutality. Many of people in the prison had not received a proper trial. There was tremendous injustice. 
I began to fight the prison authority for better condition for the inmates. In 2014, I was lucky to be released on lack of evidence. I decided to keep fighting for the land rights. I was prepared that I may get in trouble again because I realized that if I didn't take it up this struggle, many people would suffer. If we lose our land, we lose everything. We have been living here for years and years, but the Kachin people traditionally have never registered their land. We were unaware of the legal structures, so the government and companies exploit this because if we have no documents, it is not your land. I work with local people to help them to do this, but I also fight the government so that they recognize the traditional custom of land ownership. This work can be a lonely existence, but I have made a choice to dedicate my life to this cause. For decades, there has been fighting and suffering among my people. We have been left behind in every sector, the economy, health, social policies, and especially education. This is the impact of war, but the ceasefire alone is not enough to bring the peace that we desire. Without our land, there will be no peace. So this is one of uh, many stories and many life history stories that we did in, in Myanmar. And I think there's m several reasons why we picked this one specifically for the animation. Um, but for me, I think there's mainly two reasons. Um, firstly, because of course this is a very strong and powerful story of a strong and powerful uh, woman, a unique story, but it's also um, resembles so many others. I think, even though this is from specifically from Michina in, in Kachin land in, in northern Myanmar, we could find the same, many of the same stories in Shan state, in Chin state, Rakhine, and so on, especially in ethnic minority areas where there's a, a lot of suffering and there's been a lot of war for, for over 70 years. This um, this story illustrates the, long, the history that many have uh, experienced of, of war, displacement, growing up in poverty, struggle for education, a decent education, and a sense of responsibility for their communities. So Myanmar has a history of more than 50 years of military dictatorship that was paused by a decade of uh, reform. And only recently, since February, um, the military again took full control and, and we're back to where, to the situation described by Dobo Ja uh, in the early days. It's also a, a history of more than 70 years of continuous multiple civil wars, uh, and especially in the areas of uh, of ethnic minorities, that has been a very brutal uh, history that everyone is affected by. So this is why this story, I think, also illustrates the story of so many others in Myanmar. I first visited uh, Myanmar in 1998, but I've done research there for the past decade. Um, and for the past decade, I met so many politicians and, and teachers and activists and artists, and I've talked to them over and over again about current political events, what's going on, where is Myanmar going, what can we expect, where, and also the history, by all means, also the history. But it was in this project, for the first time when I started doing the life history interviews, that I realized how much the life of an individual shape who they are and what they, th how they're driven and, and what they, uh, their commitments and their initiatives. So I learned uh, really a lot from this project, and many of those that I've interviewed and did the life history interview, I've met before, and I've interviewed maybe several times before, so I thought I knew them, but, but this kind of approach 
gave a much deeper understanding of who they were. Um, and I think it's fascinating, something I found doing these life history interviews, that very often the personal stories are intertwined with the political history of Myanmar. So when people are narrating their own story, because it's always a subjective story, they uh, could say something like, I was born in 1988, in the year of the big student uprising. And that's how they want to present themselves as a person. Uh, or they could say, like, I was only two years in 1988, uh, and my, but my father was in prison and I didn't get to live with him until I was a grown-up. And when the uprising, the Saffron Revolution started in 2007, I knew exactly I had to be there, I had to take part. So the, the history of Myanmar, the political history of Myanmar is, is also shaping their personal stories when they tell them, which I think is very uh, interesting and, and also uh, something we learn a lot from. And then there's this sen sense of responsibility for their communities that we see in Dobo Cha's story, but also in all these other stories with teachers and politicians and activists that we met and, and, and interviewed. But it's a sense of responsibility, not only for the community, but also for the entire nation. And how, in a sense of duty to create a better future for Myanmar, wherever they are in the country. And I think we see that also now after the coup and the protests that has um, come through since the coup, that a lot of people find a personal responsibility to make a better uh, Myanmar. So uh, I've been studying Myanmar activists over a long time, like people like Dobok Ja, for example. And what we find also is um, activists really uh, in Myanmar really adapt incredibly well to the political situation that they operate in. Um, from before the opening, the so-called opening of, of uh, Myanmar with a, with a reform process, and uh, democratization process in from 2011. From before that, when civil society activists had no space, very little space to operate. So they couldn't really do political work, but they could create community schools, or they could create library groups, like tiny spaces where people um, could meet and discuss and people of the same mind could, could uh, get together. And when the, so really small political spaces, but when Nargis, the so cyclone Nargis hit in 2008, a huge um, cyclone that wiped away uh, the entire Arawadi Delta, when that hit, these groups of people stepped up and took responsibility where a failing state was not able to save their population. And that became a really powerful force uh, in Myanmar. And when the opening in 2011 started, they become the civil society uh, that try to push for further change and always testing the waters about how can we get more democracy within this very limited space. And then until now, when, um, when we see um, that, again, with the crackdown uh, in the coup in, in, in February, civil society groups are again going undercover. Uh, they use the old black market uh, econom economic corridors to distribute humanitarian aid to, um, to people in need. And they're going undercover, but they really are there, and they are sort of the bearers of uh, Myanmar society today. As well as artist artistic uh, expressions like our Kukul, who... Actually, that's... Oh, yeah, you still didn't have that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't matter, but Kukul had... Oh, there it was. Okay, so yeah, I didn't see that. But Kukul, who was doing the animation of Dabogja, uh, and have had her really a political awakening since the coup and become really this iconic um, 
um, illustrator of what's been going on since the coup started with the, with the protesters and the political events that are going on. Um, um, and one of the teachers that I interviewed in this project, she told me that, similar to what I said earlier, she told me, my daughter is six years old today. I was six years old in 1988. Now she's experiencing this same, what, what I was witnessing as a child. And the Spring Revolution now becomes part of the history of Myanmar's many iconic uprisings. And our artist from the Transform Project becomes also part of this. Hi, so nice to be here physically with all of you. Um, thank you, Marte, that was, that was nice. Um, my name is Trude and I'm a doctoral researcher at PRIO. And for the research I did on the TRANSFORM project, it was actually for my master's degree. Um, I did a case on student activism in Myanmar. And we didn't make um, an animation or or a comic book on this specific uh, uh, on these students, but I will show you a lot of pictures uh, uh, today. Um, yeah, so I will tell you about student activists who engaged in a long uh, fight for better education in Myanmar, and I will focus on why they decided to engage in these protests and fight for better education. Uh, and I did this research a few years ago uh, in the time that Mar Marte talked about when the country was opening up um, and political prisoners were freed and uh, media censorship was more relaxed than before. Um, but at the same time, if you use these freedoms to kind of criticize the government or criticize the military, you could be arrested by doing that. So. It was at this time that students protested against the new education law in Myanmar. And they organized several protests in 2014. And in 2015, they started a long protest march from Mandalay to Yangon. So Mandalay is kind of in the middle, a bit uh, to the north, and Yangon is down here. So they walked every day for two months, from morning to evening. Um, yeah, and on the way they received a lot of uh, support from people in the towns they passed through. But then, um, after two months, they were met by a police blockade uh, just before they kind of reached their destination. Um, and they decided after a few days to try to move past the blockade. Um, and the police, they responded with violence and by arresting over 100 students and supporters. Um, yeah, so to understand a bit about why the students were so passionate about this um, protest and, and the, the responses by the police, I have to say a bit more about what they were actually fighting for. Um, so they were fighting for like I said, against uh, an education law. So they were fighting for better education, but at the same time, they were also kind of tar targeting wider political and social issues in Myanmar. So they were demanding uh, more funding for education, which basically meant less funding for the military, for example. So the students that I talked with, they were saying like, yes, it's a protest for better education, but it's also a protest against the military for democracy, for like a real democracy that they wanted. Yeah. So why did these students like choose to take part in this protest in a context that is known for imprisoning protesters and for uh, being violent against uh, 
they, they kind of knew that it was dangerous. Uh, or it was a context that, where they were not sure exactly what kind of consequences it would lead to or what kind of, how freely they could use their voice at that time. Um, so based on interviews with these students, I found that one of their main motivations was this responsibility they felt to do something. And one of the students told me, since I'm doing these things, I can always get arrested and sent to prison. But what happened to me is that I cannot tolerate the injustice. So when I see injustice, I cannot help but, you know, we need to fight against it. That's what I believe. And when I asked them about where this sense of responsibility came from, um, many, many of the students talked about having witnessed or having experienced injustice themselves as kind of inspiring their commitment to fight against injustice. Um, for example, they talked about having seen fellow students being arrested based on protesting peacefully, um, and they've seen people's lives kind of destroyed based on this, and that, also, that only kind of strengthened their motivation to, to do something. And they also talked about having spent time in prison themselves, and that this experience only um, made them more committed to fight against injustice when they, when they got out. And we have seen this sense of responsibility across the cases that we have worked on in the Transform project um, in Myanmar, in Somalia, and in, in Syria. Um, people are kind of using challenging experiences to, to, as a force to do something good and create change. And I also wanted to end by connecting the, this the student protest that I've talked about today with the situation with the situation that's happening in Myanmar now um, after the coup in February. So uh, now it's kind of like a new generation of student activists who are who are fighting and the students who I talked with and who I've talked about today, they have kind of many of them have taken a prominent role in the protests that's going on now. And one example is A. Tinsa Mong, who was one of the, the student protesters from the protests I've talked about here. She uh, took a like, leading role in the protests um, after the coup in the streets of Yangon. Uh, so here she is in 2015 in the student protests. And, and there she is in the streets in February or March, I guess. Um, and now she's taking the position as a minister in the National Unity Government, which is the shadow, elected shadow government set up after the coup. And she was also just, yeah, like you see here, named one of the 100 most influential people of 2021 in Times Magazine. Um, yeah, so as we can see, this commitment to fight for what they believe is right is, is kind of still rooted within these individuals. And also today I'm focusing on, um, I'm working with artists, talking with artists about their role after, after the coup during this time of oppression and violence. And they talk about this similar kind of responsibility to do something. Um, seeing people killed on the streets, uh, having friends who are imprisoned and seeing their country go back to military rule, they say it's kind of like a major driving force for them to try to fight this injustice in a way. So some do it with protesting on the streets, some do it with creating these free schools or hospitals and some do it with creating art. So this is artworks made by a collage artist called Han Reality. Yeah, thank you so much. That's what I had to say. And I hope you enjoy the rest.
thanks much uh, to that. I think this is a great um, entry point also uh, to the the next part where we were uh, going to talk more about the different types of resistance that uh, we uh, we found when it's actually really difficult, as as Trude and, and Marta also refer to, it's really difficult to uh, to protest openly, and people are looking for other ways. So, if so we'll start with the video on the, the Syrian animation, and then from there, Shetel and Tamai. Engage in politics beyond the civil movement that was active early in the revolution. Politics could take you places you would not like to be. I have never dreamed of leaving the country. When the event happens, my bond to Syria grew stronger. I can help people here. Me and others like me knew we could do something. What we witnessed in Syria is horrific at all levels. The corruption, the repression, the suppression of rights, the stealing of property. But no segment has been harder hit than the women and children. I was among those who worked with different groups, social initiatives, from the first day of the protest. We started to socialize with women in the area that were hit by teaching them embroidery and knitting to allow them to rely on themselves. Newcomers came to our neighborhood and the locals started to feel they are losing their privileges. Everyone came with the story, I'm Sunni, I'm Shia, or even regional identities. These sentiments grew during the events. Since 2011, the regime have played on sectarian polarization. But our job is beyond these sectarian identities. Neutrality, here is rule number one. There was a big group of kids that were absent from school. They are our responsibility. We need to save them, take them off the street. We realized that education was becoming the most important thing. We started to gather children in houses and teach them. We were about five volunteers. They need an appropriate environment where they feel belonging. We found a very simple house, which we cleaned. We were able to buy some chairs and tables from donations. We did not have a license to operate. All our work was volunteering. We help people's return to school, and we help those who go to school but struggle. We were able to create a beautiful social atmosphere. We managed to awaken the spirit of cooperation between the peoples that has been lost. During wartime, children experience violence either outside or inside the home. We organized an open day where the children would enjoy themselves with dance and music. to cry, we asked. Why are you crying? She said, it's so loud, like the rockets and bombs. In order to compensate for the years of education lost, you have to pass on central principles to the children. We must finish two years in one. There is a lot of work, a lot of ambition. I don't know how many I'll be able to carry out, but I feel I'm on the right path. I feel that I am building stone for a stone. And I'm very happy with the team that I'm part of. Overall, I'm happy with my life. It's a drop in the ocean. Nevertheless, I think a drop is better than none. If you teach one child, then why not 200? You must teach them how to read and write, to draw, to think, music. This is the generation that will inherit Syria. We teach them how to socialize with others, how to accept the other, how to forgive, just like I was taught.
Chatel. Thank you, Cindy. Um, this has been a very fascinating research project to be part of. Um, not only f for the life story method, uh, which is, of course, was new for me as well, it, uh, discovering how much you learn about the country by listening to people's life stories. But then also doing that in three very different contexts, countries, and discovering that all the similarities and the parallels between these topics in the, in the different countries. It's been very inspiring. And finally, uh, working with this visual material, the animations, has been uh, quite inspiring as well. It's, it's not like, not all the projects I'm part of uh, end up with a <laughs> product like this. <laughs> so that has been a very rich, uh, very rich project. So thanks a lot for that, Cindy, bringing it all together. Uh, it's um, both nice and sad to be here today on the on the last event. So I, um, I wanted to connect between this animation and the research we have done in this project by picking up on five quotations from the um, animation. So the first, um, the, this, the, so this is an amalgamation of um, life stories interviews that I conducted in Lebanon, actually, with activists who were uh, working on the ground inside Syria, but who, who, who I interviewed in Lebanon. And the first quote, the woman says, I have never dreamt of leaving the country. When the events happened, my bonds to Syria grew stronger. I can help people here. I think it's important to recognize that Syrian citizens have constituted the first line of defense in the humanitarian response to the Syrian civil war. We, we often tend to forget that because we see how much the international community has mobilized for Syria. But although international donors, aid organizations, and neighboring countries also have mobilized on a very large scale, it was Syrians who did the heaviest lifting. And I think fundamentally, because they were um, the closest to the crisis, um, they were that's the ultimate reasons why it was Syrian humanitarian actors, both professionals and volunteers, went first. They saw what was happening. They responded to it, um, at least some uh, and many responded to it, uh, to the suffering of their co-citizens and the falling apart of their country. And in this animation, we have been trying to um, show uh, some of that. Or it's just an illustration, an example of that. Second quote is, I was among those who worked with different groups, social initiatives, from the first days of the protests. Now, there was a lot of civil society mobilization in Syria during and the immediate aftermath of the 2011 uprising. M much of it was political and uh, much of it was not. And gradually, with the outbreak of the civil war, um, an increasing repression, the room for political opposition all but disappeared. And many activists redirected their energies uh, to humanitarian action. In an uh, article Tamar, who will speak soon, and I have co-authored, we argued that the boundary between politics and humanitarian work in this context is very fluid. Because despite a deliberate choice of keeping politics aside, the activists find um, in educational work, for example, a channel for keeping 
their political ideas alive. Third quote, she says, we realized that education was becoming the most important thing. And, and in my research in Transform, I have uh, focused on this aspect of ed education in these very extreme situations, and so has Tamar. Mm. It has been very striking to see the the meaning that education acquires on in extreme uh, situations under war, um, at the time when the country is falling apart, how strongly people feel about the meaning of education in this in this situation, and. When I talked to these education activists, I realized that an important reason why it becomes so important for them is that they perceive that the, the, the future of the entire community is at stake. So their expectations of what will happen down the road in a generation from now works as both a negative and positive incentive to act. On the one hand, they fear that the cumulative impact of a devastating war that has left million, millions of children losing out on basic education will um, make Syria um, a, a shadow of itself, of its true self. So they're feeling that the prospects for the country look grim, and that for this reason they have to act. So that's the negative incentive. But the positive incentive is that bringing time into the equation means that what is failing today may be improved in the future. And that opens a space where these <coughs> activists can actually act. Because education activism promises to empower children and prepare them for battles to come creates a bridge to the future because the pupil of today is the citizen of tomorrow. Hence, goals that are unreachable for the moment may still be attained uh, at a later stage. A fourth quote is, we were able to create a beautiful social atmosphere. The classroom is a microcosm of society where teachers can prefigure social and political change. They may introduce new practices that appear out of reach at the scale of the country. As shown in the animation, the activists expressed concern with the peaking sectarian polarization, which, in their opinion, the regime was intentionally playing on. But when they, within the confines of their schools, they could create a different atmosphere and thereby counter the worrying developments they saw outside at the micro level. Last quote, it's a drop in the ocean, but a drop is better than none. Education, faci education facilitates activism in overloading situations by downscaling the development challenge to a manageable format in which improvements can be achieved. Knowing the depth of serious problems, anyone can be overwhelmed and discouraged from action. However, faced with the needs of a child, people are triggered to act. And here I will leave the floor to 
Tamar, who will continue this story. It's a pleasure to be here. I know uh, it's a bit repetitive, uh, but it was an amazing experience <laughs> uh, to work uh, with this great group on this stunning project. Uh, life before and after Transform is not the same. Um, I'll present very briefly some insights um, from two articles I've co-authored, uh, one with uh, Marta on Myanmar and the other with uh, Shetel on, on Syria. No? Um, education intuitively uh, is not associated with resistance. Yeah? On the contrary, even in democratic states, education tends to be connected to disciplinary and homogenizing practices. In fact, we can say that maybe the education system is the most authoritarian institution in Western democracies, no? Um, the state actively penetrates the body and minds of students uh, with the aim of molding them according to its political and some would say economic agenda. Um, when we treat education in oppressive states, this becomes even more extreme, no? And uh, there's a lot of research about how education is used to control and weaken the population, um, both in Syria and in Myanmar under the military regime. Um, we see how uh, sometimes the negligence of educational services or even the destruction um, of education services is used in order to weaken um, the population. An ignorant populace, like Shettle says, worries uh, people who uh, seek uh, democracy, no? Um, and in Myanmar, under the military, um, a developed educational system was dismantled, no? Um, Oppressive regimes also use the education to foment feelings of nationalistic feeling, um, adultation of the leader, um, and uh, create rituals and procedures that exclude uh, many elements that can be related to any plurality of thinking. No? So um, it's quite surprising that in these kind of circumstances, uh, we can see that schools can become also um, focus points for um, resistance, no? So schools are not only uh, this tool in the hands of the government, but they are also a space for intimate human interaction, yeah? So there's a combination uh, when we talk about the school uh, between a private, intimate sphere and a public arena. So in oppressive states, we see how the state in tries to control the school and these intimate human relations sometimes permit exactly the opposite, no? To resist. Um, so when we take this into account and also the fact that in Modern society, education is a, is a technical service, yes? Uh, children need education, yes? And when children don't get education, it's a humanitarian crisis, no? So um, when we take this into consideration, we see how the mixture between this technical service and the fact that it's always a forum uh, for cultural and... Uh, political projects, we see its potential uh, as a tool of change, no? So when we find ourselves in situations in which the state cannot provide education, like in the civil war in Syria, 
or is not willing to cover all the educational needs like in Myanmar, we see how citizens assume the responsibility of providing educational services. And these kind of initiatives uh, are small, they go under the radar, and many times they cover needs that the state can't cover, so they are tolerated, no? Um, so in these kind of schools, we see spatial routines, yes? We see a teacher provides information, but sometimes um, these initiatives, which on the surface seem uh, like a technical projects, like delivering educational uh, services, are actually um, assigned with a political meaning, no? And then they become an act of resistance. So, for example, in Myanmar, we saw how English teaching um, sometimes covers civic education and uh, fomenting tolerance, no? Um, but the spatial routines and the intimacy are hiding the political meaning, uh, which is known only to the close participants, because from the outside, it's a school teaching English, no? The same, but in a different version, we saw also uh, in Syria, no? With the crisis, there was a lot of um, humanitarian activity, as Shettle said. Uh, many were what is called um, citizen aid, no? Uh, people who on the personal level decide to help uh, their fellow citizens, yes? And although we know that there's this official division between humanitarian work, which is neutral and it's the now, and the emergency of the situation and more general political agendas, we saw in the interviews that activists relate these two dimensions of their activity. So I will also use um, two quotations to finish um, my part. Um, when they talk about the technical situation, we can hear them say, after a while, the Red Cross and some of the churches became involved and the need for relief was less acute. We started to think about the long-term perspective. We noticed that the majority of children were not in school. A whole generation was cut off from school. We saw that it would create problems for a long time. Like Shettle said, there's this problem of uh, the future of the country, no? But when they talk about their own activities, they say, we also have groups where we work with the kids and their parents on how to be with others. We don't restrict ourselves to reading and writing. We teach them how to socialize with others, how to accept the others, how to forgive. So we can see here how providing the educational service in this humanitarian crisis is also an attempt to struggle for the, an alternative uh, political future um, for Syria. No? So um, it was very interesting to see how um, education lends itself well to these projects of resistance when there are uh, no other uh, options. So thank you very much. Right, my name is Ebba, I'm the doctoral researcher at uh, PRIU and in this project. And the title of my presentation is The Wind That Blows Before the Rain, Resistance Against Oppression in Somaliland. In northern Somalia, in the 1980s, Somalia had just lost the war against Ethiopia. There were many refugee camps in the country, in the region, and uh, the hospital and the schools were seriously neglected. A group of teachers and doctors started to ask themselves what they can do to address this situation. And this, picture, this is a picture of them, and this picture was taken in 1982. 
They started with restoring a hospital and volunteering in schools. And two of the professionals also started to write a newsletter to create even more awareness in the community. And they spread these newsletters in secret. They called the newsletter UFO, which means the wind that blows before the rain. And this name really foreshadowed what happened next. So unfortunately, the newsletter got into the wrong hands and one of the one, the professionals, the teachers and doctors were arrested. They were interrogated and they were tortured for many months. And um, the day before their trial, they received the news that they were going to face ex execution, death sentence, at least several of them. And uh, what happened next is quite remarkable and it changed the history of the country. And I'm going to tell you more about it in a, in a little while. First, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the context. So these, re, uh, these um, events took place in Hargeisa, which is the capital of Somaliland. Uh, at the time, it was part of Somalia. So Somaliland was colonized by the British. Um, Somalia was colonized by Italy. They joined into union after independence. And then in 1991, Somaliland declared itself independent. And um, today it is um, known as a democracy. They have elections that are deemed free and fair by international observers. So in my research, in my doctoral research, I'm uh, asking why do people resist when the risks are so high? And this is, of course, a question that goes through the whole, whole project. And also, how do people resist when the political space is so restricted and it's so dangerous to do something politically? So I uh, address this question by interviewing the UFO professionals. And sometimes I get the question how I got in contact with them. And I basically just took my bike to a cafe here in Oslo where I met Ahmed Madar, who lives on Nasodden. And then he introduced me to the other professionals in Hargeisa. And I did life history interviews with them. But I also went down there. I lived, stayed with the Somali family and I stayed for a, a longer period of time, interviewed a lot of people who were present at the time who could tell me the story in their own, own words. And I was told I was very lucky to capture this story at this moment in time because the UFO professionals were reaching old age and uh, many of them had lived in the diaspora. They got political asylum in Canada, in the US, Norway, etc. So at this point in time, many of them were returning to retire in, in Somaliland. So I also gathered archival data like pictures. So this is a picture of the UFO professionals cleaning the hospital in 1981. And it's been restored in an Amnesty International report who took on their case. Uh, and the reason why Amnesty International worked on this case was because friends of UFO who lives in England and the US and other places took their case to uh, human rights organizations to lobby for their release. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of other archival material as well, but yeah, so, oh, yeah, it's the end of the, the presentation, um, but I can easily continue. So, uh, maybe I should, yeah, um, so, let me see what comes next. Now I lost track. Um, so it was meeting the archive and then we're going... Yes, of course. So I interviewed the professionals. I was wondering why did you resist? And basically they um, uh, they told me, like we've seen across the project, that they had this strong responsibility, felt this strong responsibility. And like each professional gave me unique answers, but a strong theme that came up was fighting for justice and caring for their community and also fighting for change. Um, so I was going to share a, a, a strong quote about that, but it's, uh, but I'll, uh, uh, that Dr. Tani had about, um, that he doesn't regret anything because the important thing is fighting uh, against injustice. Um, and then we have what happened, uh, the other question I had is why did they resist? How could they resist in this 
uh, situation. And as we saw in this case, they were cleaning the hospital, they were rehabilitating a hospital, they were volunteering in schools. So they were finding um, um, a, a way to act collectively where there was some room for maneuver, just as we've discussed in the previous cases as well. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't fight the justice system, they couldn't become politically active, but they could uh, do something in the humanitarian realm. So um, resistance takes many forms, which is a big finding in this project overall. But, um, and I call it resistance because they were also trying to achieve change. They were showing people that there is an alternative way. We can do things ourselves without the government. And by doing these activities, they were also showing what the government is not doing. It was not doing its job at the hospital and in the schools. And they were enacting dignity uh, and also building really strong bonds with the community. This only worked for a short time because they did get arrested. So to go back to where I, I started, they were facing execution. And uh, what happened was that um, the, the next day when they were going to have their trial, secondary school students went to the court building to protest, to demand the release of their teachers, but also to protest against uh, the government. And it was both male and female students, and a lot of other residents joined them, and uh, a lot of them women. And this was the first time in this part of the country where people were resisting the government publicly, openly, on the streets. So this was a, a big transformative moment in the history of the country. Uh, the police and the military cracked down with, with violence. And this is a picture of secondary school students from 1982. They were protesting in their school uniforms, which you can also see on this picture. They were also, I've interviewed many of them, and they were also very motivated and inspired by political poetry at the time. That they, uh, it was really popular to, to have them on small cassettes and spread them in secret, and they were popular like hit songs are popular to, to kids other places in the world. So, these, po these poems had um, a strong critical message, uh, a political message, but it was written in a hidden or composed in a hidden way. So it, might, it could look like a, a love poem, but it was actually critical uh, towards the regime. Uh, and this really formed the students, even though they were really young, secondary school students, it's formed their political consciousness in a way. And this moment when their teachers were arrested, it was a moment of poli political awakening for them. So they continued to resist, they continued to protest. And they achieved with saving the lives of the UFO professionals. The UFO professionals were not um, uh, executed, but they were sent to prison instead. Which, uh, if you want to know the whole story of them, I really recommend you to read it in the, the comic where, they where we describe the prison period in more detail. So, uh, in Somaliland today, people regard these protests at st as the beginning of the resistance, so as a transformative event. And one woman I talked to said that Ufo, the fire that they started, has changed the history. And it's commemorated every year in uh, Hargeisa, uh, and this is from the commem commemoration in February 2018. Um, um, Yes, and, but even though it's commemorated, it's commemorated as the Somaliland Youth Day, so there's not much awareness about what actually happened, and I will come back to that. The UFO professionals spent some time in prison when they were released towards the end of the 1980s, uh, even though they had been, many of them, in solitary confinement. When they were released, things had changed in the country. The resistance had grown into an armed resistance and it created a, a war to, um, against the, a war with the government. And to, uh, yeah, it's hard to, see, yeah. But what happened was that the government, who was very oppressive at this time and had a lot of weapons and military force because the US and previously Soviet supported the Siad gov government with, with a lot of military force. And what Siad Barre did was that he, towards the end of his regime, he used it against his own people. So as an, one example, he bombarded the city of Hargeisa to pieces. And basically the whole population had to leave the refugee camps in Ethiopia. And this was the exact time 
time when the UFO professionals were released from prison, and this was the scenes that they met. So um, they came to the refugee camps to meet their community, and this is how they responded. These people, the refugees, they, they are the people who saved us, and today we see their situation. It is our responsibility. We have to give them back what we can. So we thought we should go back to our previous role, which was to do voluntary work at the hospitals and schools. So they started the first humanitarian organization in Somaliland called SORA, and one of the things they did was that they built schools across Somaliland, across clans in every region. They also channeled a lot of money into the peace process uh, and played a key role there in that sense. And still, the history of these uh, professionals and their role, the role of UFO in the, in, in the history of Somaliland is really neglected. It's the neglected in scholarly literature and resistance, civil resistance, social movements, that it's not mentioned there at all. And it's also really neglected in books about the, the history of the region, which more focused on the armed resistance. And then it's also not taught to the young generation today in Somaliland or in the diaspora. So just to give you one example, I interviewed one of the professionals who works at the University of Hargeisa. And after the interview, we went to several classrooms and we asked the students there if they had heard about UFO. And, and basically no one had. And maybe, maybe someone had heard about the student uprisings, but they didn't know any details or what it was about or, or any of that. So. Uh, to create more awareness about this story, to spread these stories, that's one of the reasons we created the comic, which Ben has talked about in depth. But we also created a TV show. Uh, it was a collaboration with a TV station in Hargeisa, and it was a 13-episode TV show where we interviewed each professional for each program. And this is really a way that researchers can pass the mic to the research participants so they can tell their stories in their own language using their own storytelling skills and communication skills uh, to, the co to their communities. Um, so um, uh, it also was... Uh, um, yeah, a studio with an audience, so we invited in young people who could ask the UFO professionals questions. So it also became an arena for intergenerational dialogue, which was really fascinating. And this is uh, where I'm going to end about the, the transformative power of storytelling. Because when I went there and I talked to young people, very few had heard about UFO, as I said. And I worked with several research assistants, and they hadn't heard about UFO before, even though they were highly educated. And when they got to know more about the story, both through my research and they volunteered in the TV show, uh, they got really inspired. And one of the research assistants, who you can see on this uh, picture, she said, UFO is life-changing. And she was just so amazed to hear about these stories from her own history. She had only heard about war and violence and tribalism. And she got so inspired that she, together with one of the other research assistants, they started their own educational initiative to gather books for schools. And so it's just an example of um, how the young generation reacted to these stories. And then, um, just to give you one more example, uh, at the, in the TV studio, there was one young woman who stood up and said the UFO story, she had, had heard it before, and it really was the main story that inspired her to do voluntary work in Hargeisa today to help street children. And she uh, um, thanked the UFO group for the inspiration, and then she said to the audience, we should follow in their footsteps. And uh, here's a picture, because uh, once the young people got to understand who these professionals were and what they had did, they became starstruck, they wanted to take selfies with them. And so this is just a picture to show these lovely intergenerational meetings that took place. So I'll end with just uh, recommending the comic, which also has a very powerful example of the potential, transformative potential of storytelling when it comes to the prof UFO professionals' prison experience, where they are saved by a story, in a way. So thank you very much. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you all so much. Thanks to all of the, the researchers. I think Shettel said it very well. It's a, it's a very nice day, but it's also a, a sad day <laughs> for us. But uh, it's been really great to, uh, to see all of you here and see your, uh, 
uh, you being captured by uh, the stories and the, and the images that are shared. Um, like I said, there's no space for interaction in the formal part, but we're here at Kultusa. They serve drinks, and uh, please uh, stay around and uh, yeah, ask us questions. Uh, come with uh, come with feedback. Thank you all so much. Thank you.